So when we last left off, we were discussing these different quadric surfaces, and we ended with this one here, the paraboloid, specifically the hyperbolic paraboloid, where the horizontal traces are hyperbolas, parallel to the xz plane. We have parabolas parallel to the yz plane. We have parabolas. We have parabolas that open down in one and open up in the other. And so these vertical traces are parabolas, while the horizontal traces that slicing parallel to the xy plane are hyperbolas. So we have this, this shape here. And if we, if we want to know which one it is, we really have to look at the equation. And basically let one of the variables equal zero and figure out will it be a parabola opens up or a parabola opens down. And that will pretty much help us figure out what orientation the Pringles chip has. So let's move on. There's a few more, and then we can do a couple examples. Uh, next up is uh, the cylinders. As soon as we allow one variable to be missing, we have a cylinder. So this is actually the equation of an ellipse in 2D. So with the fact that z not being a part of the equation means that z is allowed to be anything we want it to be, and so in the xy plane, we get the ellipse that opens plus or minus a and x and plus or minus b and y. But z is allowed to be anything you want it to be, so we get an, an elliptic cylinder by letting z be the variable that's missing. And if I want this elliptic cylinder to open in y, then y is going to be the one missing. I'll have x's and z's in this equation. If I want it to open in x, then I'll have the, uh, the x as the missing variable. Okay, so that's what an elliptic cylinder is. Next up would be a hyperbolic cylinder. So we just take the, the 2D equation for a hyperbola, same as before with the minus sign. This one here, though, will open in Y. So you know which direction it's going to open in based on the one that's positive. So this one opens up in Y, along with Y is like the axis of symmetry. If I wanted to switch the X and Y and have it open in X, then, then I could do that. So the one that is in front of the subtraction is be the direction that which it opens up in. Z is not mentioned again, so Z is allowed to be anything you want to be. So take your normal hyperbola and just extend it out both upwards and downwards. So it's a hyperbolic cylinder. And then finally we have a parabolic cylinder. Just take a parabola and let Z be anything you want it to be. And you'll have a um, you know, normal equation for parabola is just you know, y equals something times x squared. And A is just some constant. It can open up and it can open down based on the value of A. And um, we'll just stick to the vertex, maybe just being at the, at the origin, although we definitely can move in someplace else. So the point is that as soon as you allow one of these variables to be missing, then you get a cylinder uh, elongated in that direction. So if you want one of the other ones to be missing, you can just take and alter this shape. And, um, and we get that. So we know then our, all of our different shapes. Here's an example question from the textbook. I believe this is our textbook, if I'm not mistaken. Um, where you're given equations and asked to match these different equations, these eight different equations, to eight different graphs based off of our analysis that we had. Now, these equations might not be in the, the standard form that we have on our slides. So we might have to do some algebra to put them into that form. So then once we do that, it's just a matter of identifying, you know. And so first up we have question number 21. x squared plus 4y squared plus 9z squared equals to 1. And so it's not quite in the form that we like, but we can put it into the form that we like. The form that we like, the standard form, has all of them squared. Yeah, x squared, y squared, and z squared. And it's set equal to 1. Um, the fact that we have these two positive, we can almost identify exactly what the shape is, but we won't be able to know, you know, how it opens up, or why does it open up more in X than Y. And so to, to identify those types of things about the shape, if I had two of these ellipsoids, I need to be able to identify one from the other. 
So put it in standard form would help that. Standard form has x squared over a squared and y squared over b squared and c squared over z squared. So um, so we need to do that. All we need to do is just, since it's already set equal to 1, then we just say that instead of multiplying by 4, we'll divide by a fourth. So this equation would be x squared over 1, y squared over a fourth, and z squared over a ninth equals to 1. And so that's why it's an ellipsoid opening uh, the majority, the major axis is in the x. That's why it's Roman numeral number 7. Okay. Now having had another one in there, we need this kind of idea to know how to distinguish one from another. Exactly. Which is the biggest number underneath? Because that biggest number underneath should be the exaggerated direction that it's opening up in. Okay, number 22 looks like it, but um, it's just different numbers. And so same idea, now it's going to be opening majorly in Z. So here's the, another ellipsoid, and it's exaggerated in the Z direction. And so that's why then that 22 should be Roman number 5, uh, 4, I'm sorry. So then we're up to 23. We have x squared minus y squared plus z squared equals 1. And then we recognize the fact that they're all squared. We recognize the presence of this negative on the y squared. If we were to name this shape, we would call it what? The fact that there's one negative means there's hyperboloid of one sheet. Okay, so it's the silo, the uh, not the silo, the uh, nuclear reactor shape. And it's going to be open in Y. Have we had another one? We have to be able to distinguish them from each other like we had to do for those ellipsoids. Um, the variable that has the minus on it is the is this axis of symmetry. So it's the uh, Roman numeral 2. Great. 24 still has all of them squared, still has it set equal to 1. The difference is now we have two negative signs, so it's going to be our hyperboloid of two sheets. Hyperboloid of two sheets, that's the um, sort of like the, uh, the, the bowl on um, one point in one direction, one point in the other direction. Right? And there's only one of those in our shapes. But if we had to distinguish it from another one, the, the variable that doesn't, the one that, the one that stands out basically, the one that isn't with the negative in front of it will be the direction in which it you know it opens up and down and it has um, that as its axis of symmetry and so that's why 23 is Roman numeral four uh, three sorry okay then we have so that's a break so these kind of four go together and then these four kind of get grouped together where it's no longer all going to be in square and, Maybe not even, not even all of them set equal to 1 anymore, or if it is, at least um, this one has a variable missing. So this one kind of stands out. If we jump to number 27, the y variable is missing. All of the other 25, 26, and 28 have all three of the variables present. And so those are the cylinders that we just talked about. Um, what kind of cylinder is it? It's an elliptic cylinder, and it opens up in y. Okay, the fact that y missing. The fact that y is missing there means it's opening in y, and then that shape there is an ellipse for the same reason that we had from before. We just um, make z squared be divided by a half. So um, x squared over 1 and z squared over a half equals to 1. That's an ellipse. Exaggerated in x doesn't look like it, but um, yeah, so that's why. This one should be Roman numeral A. Okay. And then we look at the real issue is uh, 25 versus 28. 26 should stand out next. It has all of them squared, while uh, 25 and 28 has the, the Y not squared. Okay, so if they are all squared and um, and there's a there's this plus in between here then this is a cone. 
Okay. Would you mind crossing out the ones you already used? If it helps. Okay. Roman number two, Roman number three, Roman number four, Roman number seven, Roman number eight. We're deciding between a cone, a bowl, and a saddle. And 26 is a cone. Okay. So then we have 25. And we have 28. Okay. And so between Roman numeral 5 and Roman numeral 6. Okay. So one's a bowl, one's a paraboloid, and the other one's a hyperboloid. Okay. Parabola would be 26, I'm sorry, uh, would be 25, and then the hyperboloid would be 28, so minus and there's a plus. So then um, that's how we end up with 5 being 28, Roman number 5 being 28, Roman number 6 being 25. Okay, so figure out can you put it in one of these forms where it's set equal to 1 and all the variables are present, squared? These kind of get grouped together. And then other than that, figure out, okay, if they are all squared, then, it, then it's a cone. Um, if, they're not, if they're not all squared, if one of them isn't squared, you have your choice between um, ellip, I mean, a hyperboloid or um, Uh, there's two different types of hyperboloids, and so we saw that we have an elliptic hyperboloid and a parabolic hyperboloid, and then this here is called a paraboloid. This guy here is a paraboloid. So we have to tell the difference between them. This one is the uh, one is called a parabolic paraboloid. That's what we have here, the saddle, and the other kind of paraboloid is an elliptic paraboloid. Okay, so that helps you keep them straight. Any questions about that matching question? Be able to do something like that. But more than that, be able to distinguish between, like if I have two of each type, be able to know, does it have, you know, based on the orientation, what exactly the equation should be. This comes with practice. Here's more of that. Here's the equation. Put it in standard form. I want to ask you to sketch it. That's what this question is asking. Maybe just give it a name. Put it in standard form and give it a name. And so, technically, the standard form for 31 would have um, x over some constant, y squared over some constant, and z squared over some constant, technically, for 31. So we just make the y squared be over a half and the z squared be over a third. Now what is it? The, um, the x is isolated, not squared. A uh, better way to do it if you don't want to have those halves and thirds down there is times everything by, by um, one-sixth, just to clear those out. I, I don't really quibble between one or the other. It's more fine. I don't really even care if you give me either of these. If you can take that shape, that, that equation, and know what shape it is, that's good enough for me. Okay. And that's your elliptic parabola. Okay. Um, so if you had to graph it, it would be that the vertex is at the origin. Elliptic paraboloid is a bowl. It should be opening in x. Opens in a positive x direction. Um, for it to open in a negative x direction, either I make both of these guys negative, or I put the negative over here somehow. You know, somehow maybe multiply by negative one. You know, the whole equation. And so that does a flip on it, basically. It would make it open in the negative x. And so, uh, yeah, that would be uh, that would be that shape. I wouldn't ask you to sketch the draft. Maybe just a matching or identifying the name is, is something that I, I would ask to go from equation to identification of the name and maybe 
another matching could be the name with the with the shape already drawn for you. Um, in 32, same kind of idea. More algebra though because it's already set equal to zero. And so what's different between 31 and 32 is that there's a minus instead of a plus. Okay. All that establishes is that it's not going to be a paraboloid. But the plus is a paraboloid, but the minus is a hyperboloid. Okay. And so uh, um, it's a, oh, I'm sorry, not a hyperboloid. Did I say that? I did say that, didn't I? Oh, I need to go back. Uh, not a hyper, not a, uh, el el geez, that's terrible. A parabolic uh, paraboloid, a hair, oh, geez, that's terrible. Sorry. Um, paraboloid is what both of these are called. Paraboloid. Oh, gee, that's just terrible. All right, let's just start all over again. <laughs> wow, that was just horrible. Wow. All right, both of these guys are called paraboloids. Let's just say that. Both of these guys are called paraboloids. The difference is one is elliptic and one is hyperbolic. So this is a hyperbolic paraboloid. And this is an elliptic paraboloid. Sorry about that. That is just terrible. It's these guys that are hyperboloids. This guy here and then, and then this guy here. That's just terrible. I apologize about that. This guy is your one sheet. And this guy is your two sheet. So paraboloid is when you have um, one variable not squared. All right, now we're good. That was just terrible. I feel bad about that. All right, I'm over. Here we go. It's a saddle on the side. Why is it on its side, though? All right, so it's this saddle, but why is it on its side? We said, well, to figure out how it's laying, what we need is to let one of them be zero. So if I let's say y equals zero, okay, what that means is I'm looking at the xz plane. And the question is, well, what am I looking at in the xz plane? So if I let y be zero, then what the equation says that, that, that basically x is minus z squared. And that is this parabola here. X equals minus z squared. It's let me do it a different color, maybe I don't know. Um, that's this parabola here, the downward in x, I guess. The downward uh, parabola here is that x is minus z squared, letting y be zero along the x z plane. I have this parabola that opens like this, but then letting z be zero. I have x is y squared, and that's this parabola. It lays down flat, and, the, and, and letting z be zero, that's the x, z plane, x, y plane. So in the, on the x, y plane is what you should really use to help you figure it out. Um, it opens like that, and then on the x, z plane against the, against the wall, it's going to open like that. And so drawing it, I wouldn't have you do, but to tell the difference between that and maybe a, a switch on it where I take the y squared and z squared and switch them around, knowing the difference between this shape and the other shape might be necessary. I think the other one is a rotation on that. <coughs> Only like 90 degrees, I think. Maybe, maybe 90. So, uh, so knowing that it lays down like that is, is necessary. With 33 and 34, we have to complete the square. Like we did for the spheres on the first day of class, we need that again. When we see squared terms and the x, y's, and z's not being squared, it's necessary to complete the square. There must be some shifted center, some shifted ellipsoid, something shifted. So we need to find out what the shift is. We need to be able to complete the square. So we put in some blank spaces to help us complete the square. Notice that there is no x. By itself, linear term, 
there's a y term and a z term, so we need to complete the square in y, complete the square in z, no need to complete the square in x. Completing the square in y is easier than completing the square in z because the y has a, a 1 in front of its y squared and the z squared has a 4 in front of it. So for the y squared, we'll just be able to um, take it as it is. For the z, we'll have to factor out a 4. And remember that 4 is out there. So whatever number we come up that we need to add, it really needs to first be multiplied by 4 before we go um, add it to both sides. When we get this 3 here, when we take half of that coefficient and we square it to get the 9, what we're really adding there is not 9, we're adding the 36. You have to employ the 4 back on. Here we take half and get this 2. We square it and get the 4, but there's nothing to worry about and we leave it as a 4. So we're adding a 4 to both sides and we're adding a 36 to both sides. And so what we're really adding um, is 40. We already have a negative 36 by taking this guy and shipping it over to the other side. So altogether, then this is a 4. If they all had the same coefficient in front, it would be a sphere. But with the y not having that 4, then it's an ellipsoid. Ellipsoid has a general equation where it's set equal to 1. So we can divide everything by 4. And we have that it's um, x squared and y minus 2 squared over 4, and z minus 3 squared, and that's supposed to be equal to 1. And so we see it's a, you know, it's an ellipsoid where it's more elongated in y than it is in x or z. So complete the square, and then divide by whatever that number is on the right-hand side to simplify it, to have it set equal to 1, so we can get into the standard form and so then we can match it up. You don't have to draw it, but yes, it's a it's a zero, two, three is this is the, the center, ge geographic center of the shape. And we go one in x, one in y, I'm sorry, one plus or minus one in x, plus or minus one in z, and then plus or minus two in in y. Let me uh I wanted to work out the algebra with you. Now let me erase all that and show you the animation. That's the picture there. Uh, two opening up, uh, plus or minus two in y, plus or minus one in x and in z. So it's kind of elongated in y, kind of exaggerated, and that's what the shape will look like. Not that you would have to draw, just that you'd have to match it up. You know that the center has been shifted. Really, I'd say that's the only one we're really going to do with the center being shifted, a sphere or an ellipsoid. Because otherwise, we'll just keep them anchored to the origin. Okay. I think 34 is another one of those. We have to complete the square in y and z again. There, um, the x is not squared, so it's different. But once you go and complete the square, you see that you just have a shifted center on your paraboloid. In this matter, is it an elliptic paraboloid or is it a hyperbolic paraboloid? Is it a saddle or is it a bowl? And the way you figure that out, after completing the square, I'll just skip through that quickly, sorry. Um, after completing the square, what ends up happening is it's just x equals that, 4 times that quantity squared, and plus the other z quantity squared. And so we can make that guy be over a fourth, or um, divide everything through by 4. So because there's a plus, basically, in front of the two um, squared terms and not a minus, that makes it a bowl, an elliptic paraboloid. It's a bowl. The center of the bowl is shifted, where we go two on y and two on z, and the bowl opens with the x-axis as its uh, axis of symmetry. So, go to go to the point two two on the y-z plane, and then have a bowl that opens along the x direction, positive x direction. Okay. If you want to open it towards the negative x direction, just put two negatives here, uh, one in front of the y squared term and one in front of the z squared term, and that would make it open up towards the negative x. Okay. So a little bit of algebra, then 
Just to mention. All right, that's all I can really ask you for to do. A little bit of algebra, a matching, not drawing it yourself, not sketching it yourself, but um, just identifying. Equation to name of the shape, name of the shape to the picture, and orientation, getting that part correct too. That's about it. Okay, so in summary, if they're all squared and it's set equal to one, then it's either an ellipsoid or a hyperboloid. Based on how many negatives, that'll tell you how many sheets the hyperboloid has. And then if they're all squared and, and it's not set equal to one, you can isolate one of the variables and that'll be the direction which the cone opens up in. Okay. Uh, when they're not all squared, you know, all variables are present, all variables are squared, you're one of those four shapes. Um, as soon as you take away one of the variables being squared, I'm talking about paraboloid. And if they're both positive like this, then it's a, a bowl, an elliptic paraboloid. Uh, when one of them is positive and the other one's negative, then it is a saddle shape, a hyperbolic paraboloid. Okay. I guess if, if they agree in sign, then it's an elliptic paraboloid. If they're both negative, it's going to just open in the opposite um, axis, um, opposite the z, the negative z axis. Okay, so all of them are present, but only one of them is or one of them isn't squared. And then otherwise, we the other the other shapes we had just had one of the variables not present, so we had uh, the other three shapes were all cylinders, opened in the direction of the variable that wasn't present. We had an elliptic cylinder, hyperbolic cylinder, and a parabolic cylinder. So this is kind of this 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 particular slide right here. Just copy it over to your notes. And then it'll help you do any question I can ask you about section 12.6, except the fact that you might have to do some algebra to get it into this form. But once you're in this form, it's just a recognition of paper. And then knowing what these shapes look like, maybe, maybe get a, a matching question on that. And that's it for 12.6, basically. Okay. The reason why we had it is because we needed it later. We started doing. Um, Integrals, we start doing multiple integrals and multiple derivatives. Just an identification of what these shapes look like is going to help. We, we would not have you draw them, but we need to know, okay, this looks like a cone, this looks like an ellipsoid, so that we can then um, sort of answer some calculus questions based on them. Okay. So it seemed kind of strange to fit it in here, but it, um, this, is, this is where the book has it, section 12.6. And if there aren't any questions, we'll move on then to chapter 13. Okay, so the first section of chapter 13 looks at curves in space. We'll start off, what is a, what is a function that has um, its output as vectors? So um, the, it's called a vector function. I like to just call them space curves, where we input a, a time parameter, and what comes out is a vector. And, and basically, it's sort of our current position on the curve. At that, you know, at that time t. And so um, t is going to be our parameter. That's the real variable. That's, that what we, that's what we plug in. And it returns a vector, a position vector, we call it. And so t will be like time. So for time t, I'll be in a, a specific position on the curve. My vector will take me basically from the origin to that point on the curve that I'm currently at. So it'll be a, a function. It'll be a bunch of functions single variable functions, one in each component. A function of t in the i component, a function of t in the j component, a function of t in the k component. You give me a t, and I'll be able to spit out an actual value for all those functions. And then where um, the vector that results in that is the actual point to the point on the curve where I'm at. This is called a position function. So these are component functions. And then it's a vector function, the entirety of it, 
where um, it spits out our current position on the curve. Okay, and so what do we care about? Well, now that we have these functions, everything that we did for functions of single variables back in Calc 1, we're now going to do for these guys. We'll be able to take limits on these guys, take derivatives on these guys, take integrals on these guys. We're going to find out how that works. Here's an example. Uh, we'll use this one a lot, this particular example. Basically, two of the components have either sine or cosine, and the other component has, a, has the variable t. Okay. And so what this does is you give me a different value of t, and it'll tell me where I'm at. This is a very special curve. It's called a helix. Okay. If the coefficients on sine and cosine are the same, it's a circular helix. Uh, here they're both 1, so I just travel along the unit circle. You give me a different value of t. Basically, I'm, I'm wrapping myself along the, the unit circle, t being the angle. Um, and so when t is 0, I'm at 1, 0, 0. But then as I let t traverse as, as time, as, as an angle, and when t is power over 2, I'm at 0, 1, but then t is now grown, grown to be pi over 2, so I'm up off of the xy plane. I start on the xy plane, and then I traverse this unit circle over and over again, wrapping up. It's called, the, uh, it's called a helix, a circular helix, as opposed to an elliptical helix. To get an elliptical helix, I'm going to need to make these coefficients on sine and cosine be different numbers. Okay. I think this page still works. I'll show you an animation. So the blue vector is the position vector. You give me a time t, and it points to the point on the curve I'm at. It take, connects the origin to that point on the curve. Um, t is negative. That's below the xy plane there. And then we traverse up. What's nice about this is that I can take in and uh, I can rotate this. And so I can look at a helicopter view of it or uh, underneath view. Notice that the speed isn't varying. We'll talk about speed. We'll talk about velocity, the tangent vector. And um, it's the same no matter where we're at. And so uh, if I wanted to make the helix not open in Z but open in Y, then I just make that be the one component that has the T on it. That's all. So it's very neat there. Nice animation. Java, Java applet there. A uh, more interesting uh, curve in space is called a trefoil knot. Not that you'd ever have to memorize. And we probably won't be doing too much with this one. But it's just much more um, interesting than, than that one was the circular helix. Uh, let me go to that for you. Okay, notice how the speeds vary, so it slows up and speeds, um, so it speeds up and slows down at certain points. It's better to rotate this so you can really see what's going on. It's knotty inside of itself. Pretty neat. So yeah, it speeds up. And then there's, there's different aspects of, uh, of the curve that we want to study. The, the curvature, the degree of how it twists at a certain point will be important to us. That helix had the same curvature all the way throughout. The curvature actually was a constant. Here, there's different curvature involved depending on where you're at on the curve. And so um, we'll be interested in measuring the curvature, the degree of... Um, the degree of bend at a certain point. We'll also be interested in knowing um, 
what's called the torsion, the degree of twisting at a certain point. And then we'll be measuring the arc length. If I was to start at t equals a and end at t equals b and travel along this curve, if this curve was a road and I was traveling along the road, how far would I have to travel? Arc length will be something that we'll be measuring as well. And so arc length, curvature, and torsion are aspects of curves in space that we'll be interested in, in calculating. Tree foil knot, that one's called. Okay. All right, but um, for the most part, if we're trying to do any kind of calculus on these, it'll be component-wise. If I want to calculate a limit of a vector function, I'll just do the limit on each component. That's all. And that'll tell me where I'm headed towards on the curve. So here's an example. It just boils down to three calc one limits. So if you're going to be able to answer uh, one, of four, uh, one of these 114 questions, you're going to have to go back to 103 or for AB calculus and remember how you, how you found limits. So I'm talking about the limit as t goes to zero on each of these components. The first one can be done with L'Hopital's rule. It's zero over zero. And so you take the derivative numerator, derivative denominator, and you trade it in for that limit. So you'll have cosine t and one. And as t goes to zero on that, then that limit is is a one. The second one is just a, you know, what is this function? What happens when you just plug in e equal t equals zero? It'll be e to the zero, so that's a one. And then you try to plug in t equals zero into here. One minus zero is one. Natural log of one, zero. So this is headed. So as I as t goes as time goes to zero, I'll be headed to the point on the curve one one zero. I'll be headed um, headed to that particular point. That will be my my limit vector, i plus j, <coughs> as t goes to zero. For either side, t going to zero for the positive or the negative side. So answering limit questions will be back to Calc 1. Can you do limits? L'Hopital's rule, um, just evaluating the limit. If you can, you want to um, employ L'Hopital's rule with video over video or zero over zero, employ it. Otherwise, uh, use some algebra maybe to simplify it. It's just three Calc 1 questions, that's all. <laughs> Take the derivative and end up being three calc one derivatives. So you need to know all those functions. We took derivative of us, derivatives of back back in calc one. Not not math 104, I'm talking about math 103. And so you need to know arc sine's derivative, you need to know the chain rule for the second two parts. If you're interested in evaluating the limit at a particular place. Here I just want to take and find the limit vector. And then next class, we'll call this limit vector something important. This derivative vector will be something important to us later. For now, it just means take three count one derivatives. What's the derivative of arc sine? One over root of one minus the, the variable squared. Okay, since it's just t, then you just put the t there. Had there been something more than a t, we'd need the chain rule. Uh, for the second one, we're going to need the chain rule. It'll be the root of some function, so the square root of a function, when you want to take its derivative, it'll be 1 over 2 square roots of that same function, but then the chain rule, you have to multiply by the derivative of that function. So we get 1 half, that guy to negative 1 half, but then chain rule times the inside derivative of negative 2t. For the log, log of anything should be as its derivative 1 over that same thing, but then chain rule times the derivative of that function, so times a 3. So it boils down to taking three calc one derivatives and simplifying when you get. This this is the velocity vector. We'll talk about that later. So these are meaningful objects. The limit vector is a meaningful object. Definitely the derivative vector is a meaningful object. But when it comes time for integrating, it's not as meaningful. Just integrating component wise, taking the integral of a of a um, of a position vector, it's not as meaningful. We won't be doing it too much. And so I, I think I even uh, might have had, yeah, I think our textbook doesn't even look at the interval because it's, it's useless, but it turns into three calc one intervals. That's all. We do all the time. So before we do particle motion, I think this is a good place to, let's see. All right, let me just, let me just introduce particle motion. We'll pick this up next time.
So, uh, so R of t will be the position vector, and we had said that the derivative is the uh, R prime of t, that's going to be the velocity vector from here on out. The magnitude of velocity is speed, how, how fast you're going. It can be manifested by taking the magnitude of the velocity vector. So speed and velocity are now will be different things. Velocity is a vector. It has a magnitude and it has a direction. But speed is a number. It's going to be the magnitude of that velocity. It's how long that velocity vector is. Second derivative is going to be your acceleration vector. And these aren't necessarily perpendicular to each other. I think in this picture it might look like it is. Here is a helix opening in Y. Well, actually, no. T is... T is, oh no, this, oh, this is just, uh, sorry, this is X and Y. Oh no, I'm sorry. So this is just um, an ellipse because it's sine and cosine with sine and cosine having different coefficients and there's not a third variable. This is just I and J. So this is a, an ellipse in the XY plane. Looks like that. When T is zero, you're at the point zero for X and two for why? So you start off up here, and then as t traverses, you'll be going counterclockwise. So um, for t equals pi, you'll be here. Um, t equals pi over 2, I'm sorry, you'll be going clockwise, I guess, yeah, clockwise. t equals pi over 2, you'll be here. Sine of pi over 2 is 1, cosine of pi over 2 is 0, so you'll be here. And so from 0 to pi over 2, we go here, when t is pi, will be down here. Sine of pi is zero, but cosine of pi is negative one, so it puts you down here in negative two. So it traverses this guy clockwise. The velocity vector at any time t, just take the derivative of each component. Acceleration vector at any time t, take the derivative of that. And we're going to draw in the acceleration and velocity vectors at a specific time t. The speed at any time t, just take the magnitude of velocity. And so we can get these quantities at a specific value of t. What's the position at pi over 6? I'll be 30 degrees along the way. I'll end up at a half and root 3. What's the velocity at pi over 6, the velocity vector? It'll be root 3 over 2 and negative 1. Plug a pi over 6 into that. It comes off tangent to the curve. The acceleration is going to end up pointing inward. Um, acceleration at pi over 6. This is a triple fortune. And so we have um, the acceleration at pi over 6 being negative a half and negative a root 3. Points in. They won't be at right angles always. We'll see in certain instances they will be at right angles. That's not necessarily a right angle, although it might look like it. Okay. And so um, that's where we'll pick up next time.